When we started talking at CDDRL about the internet, it was with such hope, and I'd say, um, I will confess, since I started the project and initially framed it, naive optimism. Uh, and we called the program Liberation Technology. And we defined it as an effort to understand and document, and maybe help nurture along, uh, the ways that information technology was being used to do a lot of the work that you people are trying to do, to defend human rights, to improve the quality of governance, uh, to deter and expose electoral fraud through election monitoring, to fight and track corruption, to more generally expose government wrongdoing, to uh, promote political participation, level the playing field in terms of campaign finance, empower the poor, promote economic development, protect the environment, educate consumers, Interesting applications that we documented and in a way helped trying to, uh, tried to incubate in terms of improving public health. Wow, right? Liberation technology in all respects, political, social, economic, and so on. And then in the term that has become uh, common in our uh, discussion of this, the empire struck back. Um, authoritarian regimes are, of course, fighting for their lives. They're not going to be passive in the face of this. Uh, and uh, we saw a number of uh, modes of authoritarian adaptation. One was repression, uh, like the great uh, uh, firewall in China, uh, and other, you know, not quite so comprehensive, but increasingly technologically empowered efforts to um, control, filter, censor the internet, and really uh, keep people from seeing a lot of what was on cyberspace to the point now where some people are worrying that we may be entering a world where we don't have uh, an internet, a globally accessible and interoperable cyber sphere, but a series of national intranets that are going to break apart this global phenomenon. Then um, we had the empire strikes back in the way that uh, uh, the Russian government, but many others, <clears throat> have been uh, leading in in terms of using and usurping the internet for uh, political ends, both in their own countries uh, and abroad, to advance their strategic aims and to uh, subvert, stigmatize opposition, to mobilize support and to, through the use of robots, uh, uh, internet bots, and, and trolls, and armies of internet agents, uh, create a kind of fake reality and a fake presence of um, non-human or non-authentic uh, actors who are supposedly presenting you know, grassroots and real opinions. We, of course, Tim struggles with this in his work, saw the dark side of the internet in terms of pornography and uh, exploitation of children, hate speech, uh, invitations to violence and support for terrorism. And we've seen what Nate addresses in his article and may discuss here, the way that uh, social media can become venues for severe, intense, relentless political polarization. <coughs> So here are some of the issues we're struggling with. How do we balance the right to free speech in the digital world with other values? Security, civility, privacy, obviously fighting terrorism and sexual exploitation. I think this is a good part of uh, what Tim's mission in, is in this extremely innovative and ambitious uh, online project. Secondly, how do we ensure <clears throat> that the contribution of the internet and social media to our democratic politics is going to be on balance, enriching, constructive, I say on balance, uh, politically uh, empowering and um, uh, democratizing and not fragmenting, polarizing, and uh, creating a world in which compromise becomes really impossible. And third, how do we strike a good and democratic balance among these competing values in terms of government policy, 
that seeks to regulate and facilitate the digital ecosystem. So I think those are going to be the challenges that we take up as we move from one speaker to the next, though I know they're going to engage one another. Tim, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Larry. Uh, and it's great to be back here with this terrific group. I've been writing about dissidents in various contexts for 40 years. I've been working on this book and this website for 10 years. And I now have 10 minutes uh, in which uh, <laughs> to well, fill <laughs> all the nuggets of this work. And so I'm going to essentially just make five points. The first one takes straight off from what Larry just said. The internet mm. in and of itself never set anyone free and will never set anyone <laughs> free. The internet in and of itself never oppressed anyone. This is the fallacy of technological determinism. Like all technologies, it is double-edged. Um, the first human being who discovered a knife could use it to cut their meat or to murder their neighbor. And that's true of all technologies, through history, all information and communication technologies. Because this is a big one, the upside is enormous. We have the possibility, anyone who has a smartphone, of communicating in theory directly with roughly half of humankind. That's amazing. The downside is equally large. Larry already mentioned a death threat issued in one place, carried out in another, harassment, hate speech, uh, pedophile pornography, and surveillance. Ruth Schneier, a great expert on cybersecurity, says, Surveillance is the business model of the internet. What Google and Facebook and Twitter know about you is beyond a Stasi general's wildest dream. And if you put that together with what the state knows, so it's double-edged. And the basic question before us is always, how do we maximize the opportunity and minimize the risk? Second point follows from this. Um, uh, incidentally, just uh, when I'm talking about the dangers, I was amused to read in the Guardian today that talking about the dangers of the fake news, software developed at Stanford University is able to manipulate video footage of public figures to allow a second person to put words in their mouth. So even as he, we here are talking about the danger of fake news, Somewhere else on Stanford campus, someone is inventing the tools for, <laughs> for, for fake news. Um, second point. Because of the nature of this connected world, a world in which as a result of mass migration and the internet, it's a combination of those two, we are all tendentially becoming neighbors with each other, physically and virtually. Um, the classic modern way of thinking about free speech, namely primarily in terms of the state, what the state allows and what the state forbids, should or should not, is actually not, out, not totally outmoded, but radically incomplete. I argue that your effective freedom of expression at any one time, freedom of information too, is actually determined by four forces. Number one, international treaties, organizations, and networks, formal and informal, the most obvious being the ICCPR. There are all the countries that have signed up, in theory, to Article 19. Uh, there's a list of those which can actually go to the UN Human Rights Committee. Then you have what I call the big dogs, the big cats, and the mice. The big dogs are the governments. The big cats are Facebook, Google, Twitter, Amazon, Apple. And the mice are you and me. <laughs> right? You and me. Uh, and me? the question is, what do we do about it? So first of all, the big dogs, the government. It is a cyber utopian illusion to believe that the internet has ended old-fashioned territorial sovereignty. In the year 2000, Bill Clinton said, for China to try to control the internet would be like trying to nail jello to the wall. And you know what? The Chinese Communist Party turned around and said, Bill, 
just watch us. And over the last 15 years, the Chinese Communist Party has made a pretty good stab at nailing Jello to the wall, although only, it has to be said, look at this, by developing what a Harvard study considers to be, I think plausibly, the largest apparatus of censorship in human history, because there's simply so much more speech. Then we have the big cats, um, and the position here is extraordinary. Here is the world map of social networks. Blue is, of course, Facebook, leading social network by country. As you can see, with the exception of Russia, China, and a couple of other places, Facebook is the leading social network across the world. The map of the world is painted blue. We have something utterly unprecedented, which is a global public sphere which is privately owned, and in this case, owned by one company. And then we have us, the mice, um, and here, you know much more than I do about what it means to try and use the opportunities of the Internet and face the dangers of the Internet. I argue in the book that actually networked mice have fantastic opportunities of impact. But the one quick point I would make here is it's never just the online world. It's always in combination with some more traditional media, Al Jazeera TV in the case of the Arab Spring, the physical courage and presence of people on the streets, and old-fashioned politics. So ACTA, I can tell you the story of that, was eventually brought down by a combination of civic activism and parties in the European parliaments. So I just put that point briefly on the table. It's never online on its own, it's always in some three or four dimensional combination. <coughs> Third point, it follows from this that if we are living in such a connected world where we're all becoming neighbors with everybody else and where our effective freedom of speech is determined by all those four forces, talking in terms of the law and constitutional tradition of any one country will not get you so far. It'll get you some way, but not all the way. What I argue is that we need to go back to first principles and try and work out in the simplest possible terms what it is we really want to try to achieve with free speech in all these key areas, violence, knowledge, journalism, religion, privacy, secrecy, and so on, and then work out how we get it. Who is the key addressee, right? So sometimes it will still be the state, the government, but quite often it won't be. It'll be an international organization, or it'll be Google and Facebook. Um, but first you have to know what you're trying to achieve. These 10 principles are presented in 13 languages on the website. I do urge you to go to it and use it, but I'm not going to go through all 10 because I have only 10 minutes. So my, third, my fourth point is to focus in on one area, which is media and journalism. And this goes because our subject is, after all, social media and democracy. <coughs> and our principle here is we require uncensored, diverse, trustworthy media so we can make well-informed decisions and participate fully in political life. So a stripped to essential statement of the classic argument of free speech for democratic self-government. Now, that may seem like motherhood and apple pie, but actually the terms are very carefully chosen. Uncensored, diverse, trustworthy. Most of the time, even in authoritarian regimes, the problem now is not so much explicit censorship as it is in China. It is most typically control through other means, notably ownership of the media. And I see many of you nodding around the table because you can see it once it applies. This is a piece we have about the Turkish media during the 2013 Gezi Park protests, one of the biggest civic protests, civic movements in recent Turkish history. What was Telly showing? CNN Turk was sharing a documentary about penguins. Why? Well, the piece argues persuasively because 
the main TV channels are owned by conglomerates, which are dependent on the state for advertising revenue and have many other interests, which also depend on the Erdogan regime. So you have the biggest protests for years going on in your, in your capital, and you're showing a documentary about penguins. Right? So that's go after somewhat different targets. And this brings us, <coughs> that I think is true in so many different places. In Hungary, for example, a would-be authoritarian regime, there is no censorship, but there's massive control through ownership, particular, and informal pressure. This brings me on to the key point about trustworthy, and this brings us to what we're going to spend a lot of time talking about, I think, what Larry already mentioned, everybody's talking about fake news, alternative facts, post-fact, post-truth, echo chambers, silos, disinformation and misinformation, which, by the way, I would distinguish between the two stipulatively. I think disinformation is false information deliberately circulated for political reasons, Putin's Russia being the prime example. Misinformation is Macedonian meme farms. It's false information being circulated to make money or for other reasons. Disinformation <coughs> and misinformation. Now, I want to make a very simple, very boring point here, which is something that academics say far too often, which is we need more research. But we really do, because there is out there, you only have to open the New York Times, and there's another op-ed making sweeping generalizations about fake news and echo chambers. Actually, we don't really know what is going on. There is relatively little good empirical research. Uh, there is some. This is a paper which I commend to all of you by my colleague Jonathan Bright, who looks at political posting on Twitter. And what he finds is slightly more complicated than the usual picture. What he finds is that People who are in the middle, broadly defined, in the political center, and that's quite a large political center in the case of, say, Germany or Canada, much smaller in other countries, actually are getting more diverse news and views through the internet and social media. But people with strong ideological views at the extremes, there you see the really strong echo chamber effect and the polarization effects. And so it's a, a somewhat more differentiated finding. It's the, the ideologically uh, fired up, the crusaders, who really are in the echo chambers. Um, there's a rather similar finding in a, in a Stanford study, which I also commend to you. There's one other finding which I think is well established, which is that false information whether disinformation or misinformation <coughs> is as likely or more likely to go viral than accurate information. That, I think, is a reasonably well-established finding. And this takes me to my fifth and final point in introduction, which is to um, ask the question, which I think we should be asking, one of the questions we should be asking. We've all thought a lot about what we should ask of the state and what government and courts should do. There's a vast literature for it, on it. There are international organizations. There are treaties covering it. But we have this whole new incredibly important player, the big cats, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, Apple, Tencent, Baidu in China, what I call the private superpower. And the question we should be asking is, what should we together be asking of them? What are the most important things to ask of them? Because if you talk to the people at the top of these companies, many of whom, by the way, are good American liberals and readers of the New York Times, uh, they say, our problem is, from where we sit, we're being bombarded from all sides, 360 degrees, and many of these demands are contradictory. So the free speech advocacy groups are saying, leave more content up. But the women's rights and LGBTQI uh, and, and, and minority rights groups are saying, take more content down. 
because it's hate speech. Privacy and data protection uh, advocates are saying, uh, do more to protect our privacy. Security agencies and governments are saying, share more private information with us to help us fight terrorism. So they, I think, quite reasonably say, what is it you want us to do? Um, get together and work out some set of demands which those broadly interested in liberal democracy, human rights, and free speech would, would want, of, want of us. Let me finally <coughs> just mention, and this is just to throw open the, the discussion, a few things I think we could talk about as, as asks of the private superpowers. Number one, a major reason why we don't really know what is going on is that we don't have the data. The only people who have the data are Google and Facebook, and on the whole, they're not sharing it with us. So my colleague's study was done with Twitter, because Twitter's an exception, it does share its data. So one demand I think we can reasonably make is give us enough data so we can actually work out what's going on, because that is absolutely in the public interest since you have a privately owned public sphere. Secondly, and I put it to you for discussion, I think we need to go back to Facebook on its real name policy. Mm -hmm. Anonymity is a double-edged sword. It's the protection for the uh, pedophile and the terrorist, but as you all know, it's also the protection for the dissident and the human rights campaigner. The Electronic Front Frontier Foundation went to Facebook a few years ago and said, why don't we agree to this? You have a real name policy, but you acknowledge that there are circumstances in which people absolutely legitimately need anonymity. For example, when you're working in an authoritarian regime or an oppressive community. Allow anonymity on the condition that you have a real e-name address which has been requested this. That seems to me quite a reasonable compromise. Facebook said no. I think we should be demanding anonymity for those who really need it. Uh, thirdly, um, I think in the whole area of disinformation, and Stanford's been doing a lot of work on this, one thing we could ask them to look at is of taking down bad bots. Because if you identify a, a mass bot attack, it's a pretty good bet that it's a bad actor of one kind or another, okay? So I think that's something we could at least discuss. I don't think we should be doing what the Germans are doing, which is say, take down fake news, because we don't want the state getting into the business of deciding what is true and what is false. But I think take down the bots. I also think that on Facebook newsfeed, we can reasonably ask them to show us roughly what the algorithm is doing and to ask that it gives a greater diversity of news and views, because that is actually a public good which is vital to a democracy. At the moment, what we know about the algorithm is that it privileges the viral over everything else, what is shared. And so in the balance between what I might call virality and veracity, which is the key journalistic and democratic value, I think we could reasonably ask of them to put more weight in the newsfeed algorithm on veracity, and not just on vir virality, where it's a fake news <coughs> that gets shared. Those are just a few suggestions to open up the discussion, which I very much look forward to. OK, <laughs> Nate, if you're with us, you're on. So I'm going to pick up uh, to some extent where Tim left off because I'm here in New York uh, at a meeting that's organized by Facebook with social scientists uh, in order for uh, us to advise them on uh, what they should be studying and what data they should make available to us. Um, and so this is the first step, at least, that Facebook is taking in order to to um, do some of the things that, that Tim mentioned. I'm sorry I'm not there, but, you know, it's uh, uh, for for reasons associated with this conference. I should say just the, the way I became interested in this topic of social media and democracy was from the lens of campaign finance. Because before the 2016 election, for the most part, when we talked about the internet and democracy, we were holding up the model of, um, you know, uh, uh, 
Obama's digital campaign geniuses or the success of micro-targeting or the fact that uh, TV was no longer going to be the primary medium of political campaigning. Um, and it was, as, as uh, Larry suggested, more a liberation theology uh, sort of, or liberation um, technology story than, um, than the sort of dark cast of, that has come since the 2016 election, as well as associated events in Europe and elsewhere. I was thinking about this issue from the standpoint of campaign finance. We talked about the campaign finance problem uh, was with television as the sort of primary mode of communication. And so I had written, a, at, at Frank Fukuyama's urging, wrote a, an article a few years ago uh, saying the campaign revolution wouldn't be televised. It was all about the implications of moving from television to the internet uh, for campaign finance law, as well as um, regulating political communication. And so uh, we in the US had a very significant Supreme Court case, maybe one of the most notorious in the last 20 years, called uh, Citizens United versus FEC, which gave um, the uh, right to corporations to uh, basically run, spend as much money as they want advocating for the election and defeat of candidates. But that case really wasn't about um, television commercials. It was about a, a movie called Hillary the Movie that um, a nonprofit corporation had put on demand, sort of like HBO on demand or other kinds of on demand programming. And the case, while it's been sort of talked about in the context of giving corporations human rights, or, or, or First Amendment rights was really uh, a case about changing technology and about what happens when you move from linear television programming to uh, on-demand uh, non-linear programming through the internet or through other uh, types of technologies and what the implications would be for that. And so that was my sort of entry point. And since then, we've had conferences at Stanford and I've been working somewhat with the platforms um, uh, like I said, I'm here with Facebook in, in New York uh, and have done some work with Google over the last few years as well. We often identify with um, the internet and campaigning, things like fake news or hate speech and the like, because um, th those are in some ways just manifestations of old problems that we're seeing online. And, and what I would try to focus on, what is unique about the technology of the internet that then has particular, uh, threatens democracies in particular? And so um, I've come up with six, uh, six different uh, uh, uniquenesses of uh, the internet that have particular uh, potential for threats to democracy. Some of them uh, Tim mentioned, and I won't go into detail with them, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just give you the list up front. And, and I don't think I'll have time to talk about solutions, um, but, but that would be something that we could talk about in the Q&A. So the first is the velocity of communication, the fact that now, um, you know, uh, with the internet, we, we speak uh, more quickly and you can get your um, information and communication out there um, more quickly than at any point in human history to a larger audience. Second, as Tim mentioned, the virality of communication, the unmediated uh, form of com uh, communication that is, uh, you know, predominant because of social media. Third, anonymity uh, that Tim also mentioned which facilitates both the bot activity and the hate speech uh, that he mentioned. Fourth is this, this, what we call homophily or echo chambers and filter bubbles, the ability to opt into um, um, even more narrow selective communities online, which you really couldn't um, in the pre-internet world. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, fifth is the lack of sovereignty uh, in regulating the internet. So when it, it used to be that you could easily control the communication environment for, for uh, electoral communication, we in the U.S. have a you know federal communication commission, federal election commission. Um, but once the you know the world wide web is worldwide after all, and so uh, that is why among other things you can't protect your you know democracy from foreign influence uh, today in the way you could if you were regulating the airwaves. And finally, and I won't spend too much time on this because I think Tim dealt uh, with this very well, is the problem of monopoly. So while there, it was true that we had, say, three television networks or we had uh, major newspapers, uh, we, there's never been anything like Facebook, Google, uh, and Twitter in terms of the power that they have to shape communication across uh, so many domains. All right, so that, that, that's the, the, uh, the big points. And let me, let me just try to flesh uh, them out a little bit. So um, if you look on the internet, you'll find this quote, a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth 
is putting on its shoes. I don't know if you've ever heard that, that quote. It's attributed on uh, the internet, I saw to Mark Twain in 1919. Turns out Mark Twain was dead by 1919, so that's just <laughs> <laughs> of, of even you know fake news about internet uh, velocity. But the point of the quote, which is got a sort of interesting pedigree, is that um, in the you know, certain, and, and, and in, in relation to the topic we're talking about, is that uh, you know the cat is is much more quickly out of the bag in the internet age than in. Uh, pre-internet age, and that it is for false beliefs, uh, cessationalist language, or for that matter, any communication to get uh, widely uh, transmitted um, than it was previously. That is important in particular when it comes to democracy and elections, because uh, as we saw in this past election in the US, um, timing uh, is crucial in an election, so that if you can skillfully uh, 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 transmit information, communication, lies, in the lead up to an election, um, it's extremely difficult to claw that back, uh, it, you know, and, and to try to sort of have a speech combat speech, uh, a, you know, false speech uh, in the time period before people vote. All right. Related to that also is this problem of virality. And so the, the um, and, and I should say, as Tim mentioned before, right, the internet is a tool, a double-edged sword, it can be used for good or ill. and and. This is, again, a strength and weakness of the internet that it has the sort of lack of uh, mediation that we had in the pre-internet world. In the US, uh, you know, prior to the internet um, um, and certainly prior to cable uh, programming, we had three main television networks. You had roughly a third of the population would watch the evening news. We had a famous television personality, Walter Cronkite, who would literally end each broadcast by saying, that's just the way it is. Okay. Now there is no one in in America tonight, you know, these days in the media who can say that's just the way it is, and people will actually believe that person. Uh, people have opted into their own um, uh, news sources, uh, and more importantly, they they're getting so much more of their news from their friends through their Facebook feeds, through their uh, Twitter contacts, and the like. Uh, and so that has facilitated the kind of polarization in media and information systems uh, that we see. One consequence of that is the, the problem of fake news that, that both Larry and Tim were discussing. Fake news, you know, everyone hates the term fake news who talks about this, but, but that's the way we talk about it, so I'll, I'll adopt that. Um, as, as Tim mentioned, in distinguishing between disinformation and misinformation, there's all kinds of, of fake news, right? There is the, um, the fake news for profit, like the Macedonian teenager problem. There is the, um, uh, the problem of reckless reporting problem of conspiracy theories that we saw uh, in the US election, uh, even leading to some violence, you know, in the it's famous, what we, I can talk about this afterward, the Pizzagate incident in Washington, DC. Um, but as Tim said, there is, there is considerable debate about how much of this false reporting is actually having an effect on people's uh, knowledge and attitudes. We do know that there is, you know, widespread belief in false facts, whether it's um, that President Obama was born in another country or that there weren't wep that weapons of mass destruction were, were found in Iraq or any number of things dealing uh, you know, with the personalities in this past campaign. We know from the studies of Twitter that in the run up to the, the 2016 election that the uh, fake news URLs to fake news sites were competitive with the, uh, you know, the mainstream media. So uh, roughly 15% of the tweets uh, in the run up to the election in the US that had uh, news links were linking to uh, fake news sites. Um, engagement on Facebook with false stories was as um, high, if not higher than engagement with stories from the New York Times, Washington Post and the like. But as, as Tim mentioned um, and, and put up on the screen from my, our colleague, Matt Genskow, you know, it's very hard to figure out the actual effect of fake news on uh, people's voting behavior and the like. It may be that people who opt into some of, a lot of these uh, false stories are ones who, uh, you know, if, if you get a story that says the Pope has endorsed Donald Trump, you might be someone who's already very likely to support uh, Donald Trump, right? 
Next problem, as I said before, is the problem of anonymity. And again, as Tim mentioned, you know, anonymity has its benefits as well as its costs. I'll just focus on two problems, um, hate speech and bots. The, um, uh, because the internet, this is again, another area where the internet has facilitated um, widespread unaccountable speech um, that, that uh, sometimes is not even done by humans. In the case of, of bots, we, for example, know that uh, roughly 15% well, roughly uh, eight to ten percent of all Twitter accounts are bots. In Russia, by the way, it's forty-five percent of Twitter accounts are, are bots now. Um, in the U.S., roughly fifteen percent of the election-related conversation um, in the run-up to the uh, in the debates or so uh, was uh, done by bots. Something like a third of Donald Trump's followers, maybe something a little bit less for Hillary Clinton, were bots. And so you had, you know, you have that that problem. It's mainly, I should say, a problem on Twitter than Facebook. Facebook has been more aggressive in getting at the bots. Um, bots, I should say, are also one of these double-edged swords. You can have bots that do good things as well. You can have a bot that tells you the weather every day, right? Um, and so uh, banning all bots is a, is a sort of hard thing to, to do. But what you want to do is try and get at these um, problematic bots that are spreading uh, misinformation. Um, uh, so in the run-up to the election, as I said, roughly 15% of all election-related stories uh, on Twitter came from bots, and there were over 400,000 bots that produced uh, 4 million election-related tweets just in a, uh, one of the months preceding the election. Um, we mentioned hate speech, and I'll say this is one area that we've got some really good research uh, by my colleague Josh Tucker here at NYU, um, and one of the things he finds is that um, it's not clear that hate speech has actually risen online, um, at least over the last year or so. Uh, there's no question that there's been an increase in hate speech directed toward journalists. Um, uh, and you could see that, if, you know, you, you follow any prominent journalists who've been on the receiving end of this. Um, but but he, he looks at it as a very sort of creative way of trying to measure hate speech and, and to look at um, what's been happening on Twitter. And he's specifically looking on Twitter and doesn't see a kind of secular rise in hate speech over the course of the election. It does seem like there was a rise in white nationalist rhetoric as well as misogynist rhetoric in the month or so after the US election. But we'll see whether that uh, continues. Next, talking about homophily or echo chambers, um, there's no question that the, the uh, internet facilitates community building for good or ill, right? And so you, if you go on Reddit, you can find a community that's dedicated to, you know, certain types of dog species or, you know, other kinds of pets, right? Um, as well as finding a group of neo-Nazis if you want to uh, uh, associate with them. And so the kind of cauldrons of hate that, that uh, uh, you can find on the internet are facilitated by the echo chambers that um, certain websites uh, you know, make available. But the, the, one of the critical questions in thinking about this problem of echo chambers is to ask the question as compared to what? And by that I mean, to what extent does your social media feed really different than the types of people you would meet offline, right? And so there is good arguments to suggest that the people that you see on Facebook are actually more politically diverse than, for example, if you were to walk outside right now down University Avenue in Palo Alto, or if I were to walk outside here and go into Greenwich Village, right? <laughs> and that um, there's no question that there's increased polarization online. There's increased polarization in terms of, um, you know, extremists uh, uh, opting into different news sources and the like. But that is true in the offline world as well. Uh, and so this is another area where Matt Genskow has done some uh, formative work. Uh, in finding that, you know, um, the internet is at least uh, as politically diverse as your offline lives, say, in your workplace or in your um, uh, neighborhood, and it's probably more politically diverse than a lot of those places. Finally, last two points, uh, sovereignty and monopoly, somewhat related, but um, in thinking about sovereignty, we know what happened with the, well, we are, we are continuing to learn what's happened in terms of the Russian intervention into the U.S. election. Um, but many of you come from um, uh, countries where, where this is a, a problem that you've known for some time. Um, and, you know, we saw we're going to sort of continue to get more information about what happened in the U.S. election. But now that the, um, the, the, the 
I don't know, the, the model has been suggested or that, that people have seen what, what may have happened in this election is going to, I think, become more prevalent. And I think, you know, the U.S. would, would take more defensive tactics around the world. Uh, and, and I should say, of course, this is in the age of the, in the pre-internet age, obviously the U.S. It, it, uh, uh, tried to influence elections around the world. It's like, this is not a new thing. But the point is that when you think about the, the communication ecosystem and how uh, it used to be that that nations were able to regulate their uh, sort of political communication in ways that um, were a little bit more um, uh, powerful. Now, with the uh, advent of the internet, um, that you cannot essentially tell, right? If you you know whether uh, speech is coming from Russia, coming from Macedonia, or coming from uh, Tennessee. Uh, last, I'll, I'll just mention monopoly, and I'll and I'll suggest you know sort of the irony here, which is that on the one hand we have this extremely fragmented media environment have the the big television stations having the um, power that they once did and yet this concentration of content delivery through the main platforms google facebook and uh, twitter each one of those um platforms though sort of behaves in a different way and has uh different pathologies that are associated with it. and i could we'll talk a little bit about that let me just end by, by uh, throwing out there what I think the reform universe looks like. The, um, what I call the sort of six Ds of reform. I didn't intentionally have them as they all happen to start with D, but uh, so it goes. Um, the first is thinking about uh, reforms based on disclosure, trying to find out the identities of people who are engaging in, in media uh, and the like. That's one of the things that Tim was mentioning. That, of course, again, is a double-edged sword because you worry about the um, um, what would happen worldwide if we forced uh, you know, people not to be anonymous. Second is demotion, um, moving, ma making sure that certain types of, whether it's false or hateful speech, is then demoted in content and search results and the like. The third is delay. Um, that you. This is one of the, the things that um, uh, the former head of Google News has suggested which is that when there's, when there's certain speech that is achieving a certain level of virality, that the platforms could delay uh, the, the content from gaining that kind of popularity, uh, at least until they could be, it could be checked for truth and, and the like. Fourth is dilution. Um, this is actually one of the things that, that uh, well, you have in European democracies where there's real public broadcasting where they can try to sort of combat bad speech with, with uh, uh, over assault of good speech. But also, um, this is related to the next point, which is distraction and diversion. This is something that um, our colleague Jennifer Pan at Stanford has researched with China. It's not just that they uh, ban speech, uh, but it's also that they try to divert uh, speech on certain topics in different directions through uh, sort of government intervention into social media environments and through um, trying to essentially pollute hashtags and to uh, distract from the kinds of speech that they seem as threatening. And then finally is uh, deletion, which is just basic censorship. And while we, you know, we recoil at the idea about that, um, we should recognize that the, the social media platforms do this already. Um, that they regulate an enormous amount of content, whether it's intellectual property reasons, incitement, hate speech, certain types of advertising, like for guns or for um, uh, drugs and the like, uh, let alone um, obscenity and other uh, characteristic areas uh, that of, of sort of First Amendment controversy. And I should say that if in the United States we legislated into law the terms of service of Google, Facebook, or uh, Twitter, they would all violate the Constitution, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, this is by way of saying that that to think about these platforms as being just the same as governmental entities and, and um, uh, obeying the same types of constitutional rules is the mistake because they don't do it already. And the real question is whether the rules that they've developed for commerce and the like should be the same ones that they uh, apply for politics. And I will leave you with that question mm -hmm. and look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Nate. Uh, you obviously love democracy so much that every reform idea you get also begins with the letter D, so that's very <laughs> inspiring. Um, now we go to the Global Digital Policy Incubator, which is actually uh, an effort to try and translate some of these ideas and concerns 
into policy reconciliation and innovation. So Eileen, over to you. And I will, I will just take it up right there with what, what Tim said was his goal is we're all looking to capitalize on the upside benefit of technology and protecting against the downside risk. That's the, that's the optimization that we're trying to do. Um, let me just say, I'm in the same boat as everybody else. This is the most fascinating, complex topic. It is very difficult to distill into 10 minutes. It also happens to be somewhat terrifying. Um, I come at this as a human rights advocate and someone who um, is trying to hold on to basic optimism about the potential of digital technology for society, whether it's for economic development, freedom of expression, and the work of civil society generally. The part that I am most concerned about is that we started with this great moment of optimism, as Larry said, and many of us were very naive about you know, the, the good guys were ahead of the curve and we're going to be able to use technology and run away from authoritarian governments. We've, we've seen that authoritarians have caught up and they actually use the internet very effectively to control information and they are also now flooding social media with propaganda. Um, there is this sense that anti-democratic forces are using technology much, much more effectively than the good guys. And we also have this extraterritorial reach of authoritarian governments across geographic boundaries to disrupt democratic processes in other places. And it's just terrifying. Um, you know, there's this whole spectrum of ills that, that um, Tim and Nate talked about. But, the, but what we have is this bizarre interplay globally between foreign and domestic anti-democratic forces. Um, the key question, I think, is what should democratically inclined governments do about it? Um, Nate brought up, I think, I think you had a list of six different characteristics that make governing with respect to digital technology challenging. I would highlight three. And these are characteristics that have been challenging from the beginning of the internet. They're not just related to this dark moment. The first of which is simply the extraterritorial mode of operation is inherently challenging to an international order based on the concept of sovereign nation states with uh, jurisdiction over territorial boundaries and people within it. It doesn't mean, as, as Tim said, it, we, we, it doesn't mean the end of sovereignty whatsoever. In fact, we've seen a total retrenchment in that regard. But it is certainly challenging democratic <coughs> governments because these platforms are global. Um, and there are big jurisdictional questions about how far a, gov a, a government's reach should extend. The other, the second characteristics that I would highlight of what's make democratic governance difficult is digitization itself. The digitization of everything is inherently challenging to democracy, whether it's surveillance capitalism or by the state. And the very simple idea is obviously you, you it's an ero it's a erosion of privacy in the extreme, and it turns out privacy is very important to freedom of expression, freedom of assembly and association. The simple idea being that if everything you say and do is tracked and monitored, it will have a chilling effect on what you feel free to say, where you feel free to go, what you feel free to do, what you feel free to search for. So, it, and, and it also, you know, in the, in the big picture, it risks inverting the democratic order itself. The idea that the people are sovereign, the people watch the government. We now have this flipped and it's the combination of government and private sector. The cats and the dogs together are, are, are monitoring everything we do. The third characteristic that I would highlight is this tr basic trend toward privatization of governance, which is just happening under our feet by virtue of the fact that the private sector owns, operates, and secures most of the critical internet infrastructure that we use. And in addition, the platforms have become effectively the public square for society. And those platforms and the boundaries of freedom of expression are being controlled by terms of service, community guidelines, and algorithms. 
And so that is a dramatic change. Um, so, you know, and I think the idea there is part of what's so challenging about that is that the private sector is not democratically accountable. Um, in, in, a, in the democratic arrangement, the idea is that the people are sovereign, they, they, they enter into a social contract with government, the government provides liberty and security under the rule of law. And what we have seen is that those governing responsibilities have shifted to the private sector, and yet we don't have a system of democratic accountability. Similarly, the other thing that's been disrupted, very important in democracy, is journalism and the professional media. And uh, they've all been disrupted. They're struggling to find a business model. Um, and, the, you know, the, and yet they, the, journalism has functioned as the watchdog of government in democracy. And so we've lost that source of accountability. And I, I think those are, those are big issues for us to grapple with. Um, we've seen a lot of tension over time since we've had the internet within democratic governments and between democratic governments of how do you do democratic government governance with the internet. So, so the prototypical case of tension within a democratic system was the FBI versus Apple case. Th that question of how do you optimize simultaneously for privacy of citizens, digital security of citizens, and law enforcement interests in access to information and national security needs. That, that tension is still unresolved. We've seen tensions between dem democracies, most notably the transatlantic tensions over uh, whether the interest of protecting privacy of citizens in one place warrants taking down content and potentially undermining freedom of expression for people around the world uh, with the right to be forgotten case. Again, unresolved. It's still under debate in Europe. Um, I think that what's going on now is new, though. And the new tension is between freedom of expression, pure free speech, unadulterated, more speech to counter bad speech approach on the one hand, and the quality of discourse that's necessary to sustain a democracy. And the, the trend from the internet of democratizing the means of distributing content, which we thought was nothing but a force for good, now turns out to be eroding the quality of discourse necessary in democracy. And I think if you add this to the InfoOps problem, where you know, especially the Russians reaching into the US election and the European elections, I think it's just brought us to this breaking point um, and causing democratically inclined governments to want to regulate in ways, but without necessarily being very thoughtful about it. Um, and so let me, let me just turn to what I, my biggest concern I would say, is that democratically inclined governments risk doing even greater damage to democracy than the disinformation they're trying to protect against. Um, and I would highlight the case of the German network enforcement law that was passed on June 30th. Um, this is just like a primo example of what not to do. This law effectively requires networks to delete what, quote unquote, evidently unlawful content within 24 hours. It does not provide a definition of what evidently unlawful is or criteria for that assessment. Um, this move effectively handed over judicial authority to the private sector for what should be a government responsibility. It's, it's a democratic government. They've defined what's criminal in their society. They have handed over judicial authority for assessing when third party speech meets that, those criteria to the private sector. They simultaneously, in that same move, have imposed liability on platforms for the speech of third parties. And 
they've really incentivized extra censorship by making the fines so great, 50 million euros for failure to take down criminal speech within 24 hours. So this move undermines the core concept of platform immunity from liability for third party speech, which has very much been the linchpin of the free flow of information globally and the democratization of discourse. So um, I would say, you know, bottom line, the German government has essentially thrown freedom of expression and the free flow of information under the bus in the name of security and democracy, and that that's a big mistake. The question is, what should be the responsibility of platforms? What should the roles and responsibilities be? I very much agree, Tim, you brought up effectively, you, you, I don't think you use the word, but the scrutability of algorithms mm -hmm. we need. Diversity of content should be baked into the algorithms as a support for freedom of expression. I completely agree with that. Um, I think the, the simple idea is platforms should not be liable for third party speech on their platforms. They should be required to take it down when instructed by a judicial authority if something is criminal. But platforms should instead, this is the focus, the platforms should be responsible for what they are intentionally pushing with their algorithms. And as Nate said, demoting bad content or fake content. Um, fake news in and of itself, whether it's misinformation or disinformation, is not technically illegal, should not be illegal in a democracy. And the reason for this, we've been reminded by civil society actors from around the world, that authoritarian governments like to control what information is perceived as legitimate. And if the government gets in the business of defining what is you know, legitimate info and what you can and cannot say, that in and of itself erodes democracy and we do not want democratic governments moving in that direction. Um, I want to highlight last, I'd say, a couple of things that platforms have already done, um, which I think are very important moves. Um, probably, you know, up, up there is Google recently banned 200 publishers for impersonating real news sites. It was not based on the content so much as the the manipulation and the impersonation. And I think there's a really interesting uh, vein uh, for study here about encouraging platforms to think about manipulation through various mechanisms rather than evaluating content of speech and, and taking it down on the basis of content. Um, you know, obviously Facebook and Google, Google have worked hard to advance journalism projects and helping journalists find sustainable business models. They've created a, a global forum on counterterrorism to share knowledge and research about how to identify terrorist content. Um, very importantly, um, Facebook has committed to combat information operations. And this, again, is a really interesting move um, because it's not content-based, it's based on inauthentic amplifiers and mechanisms of manipulation. As, and they feel very justified in going after those, those mechanisms, and I think that's a great, great move. Um, two other really interesting moves that, to, that the platforms have made one, in April, Google announced that it was tweaking its algorithm to surface higher quality content. Um, and I think this goes to um, Nate's, your point about demotion. The, the idea here of, of bad content, demoting bad content. So the idea in, in the Google algorithm it ha has been that there's a semi subjective quality built in, which is what does this person want when they use this, when they enter this search, what are they seeking? And they're you're trying to give you what you want. There's also been a semi-objective strand, which is more like crowdsourcing what do most people think is the right answer to this query, like a majoritarian kind of view. Those things have existed. They have also now added what might be viewed as a more 
objective, qualitative assessment of the information itself. And they are factoring in indicia, signals of authority, indicia that, that the information was garnered through fact checking or source credibility, things that journalists would have normally done. And so they're trying to bake in that qualitative assessment. Um, and also Facebook made a change to its mission statement, which uh, is based on um, building community, which I think points to um, a enhancement of quality of discourse, not just allowing users to share. T I think time's up. Most basic point I can make is um, democratic government, it, it's always been difficult. Optimizing for freedom, security, and democracy is hard. And I think democratically oriented governments should not throw freedom of expression under the bus in the name of protecting either security or um, democracy. Great, well, what a rich uh, and interestingly reinforcing, though not uh, in any way identical set of comments. So thanks to the three of you, just, uh, just awesome.